All right, mic's on. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming to the second climate change forum that we've held here at the library. Uh, my name is Benjamin Nuss. I am the Renewable Energy Technician Instructor at Mid-State Technical College. Uh, I have been in renewable energy and sustainability for about 15 years now. This is my, my profession. Um, and for me, something of dealing with sustainability and climate change has really been part of my entire cognizant life. Uh, in 1992, the United Nations Framework Convention uh, on Climate Change were formed at Rio, and 154 nations, including the United States, agreed to halt global climate change. They said, we're going to stop global climate change, and we know we have to reduce our emissions. This is 1992. I was 11 years old. So I have spent my entire life through a chorus of fighting global climate change. Currently, in 2019, global emissions are 30% higher than they were in 1992. Uh, so one, I think it's just important that we move beyond commitments and into actions. I drove here in an electric car. I have a house that's entirely heated uh, by both the sun and by wood. My home has electric solar that produces more energy than I consume. And I say that not to brag, but to point out that this is doable, that this is attainable. And, and I'm not special, right? I'm not special, I'm not extra smart. I just had the desire to make that happen. And that's part of what this forum about is tonight, is about moving beyond commitments and saying, what are some manageable things that we can do as a community to band together to make some sort of those uh, impacts. So we're gonna have a number of presentations here tonight. We're gonna start off um, with uh, three presentations and then we're gonna have a little bit of discussion. Uh, so starting off, Nancy Turk from the UW Extension Wood County is gonna talk about climate change in Wisconsin. Where do we go from here? Uh, Mayor Zach Brunick, sorry, Brunick. Uh, it will discuss a more sustainable city. Uh, and uh, Wood County Board Chairman Doug Mahan will talk about the power of sustainable placemaking. Um, those presentations are going to last about an hour, and then we are going to have a community conversation. And it'll be a guided community conversation where we get your feedback and we get your input on how to make a difference right here. So I'm going to turn it over to Nancy. All right. All right. Thank you, Ben. I'm getting my timer on because the last time we did a climate forum, I went over a bit. And I'm told not to do that. Okay. So, as Ben ma mentioned, I work right here in Wood County with UW Extension. And I have a fairly extensive background working on climate change topics ranging from how our Lakes and rivers are affected in Wisconsin from climate change to um, how communities are dealing with this. So tonight, I'm kind of setting the stage for the, the rest of the conversations, and I'm particularly looking forward to um, the ideas that you guys have. When we're going to break into small groups later on and you're going to have an opportunity to come up with some ideas to share with um, the other speakers to consider in terms of things you think the community should be working on or thinking about. Um, so I'm first going to touch on climate change and what's happening in the big picture. I think a lot of people are up to speed on that, but it's always good for a little bit of a review and then talk a little bit about um, some of the key points on what's being affected in Wisconsin related to climate change. And then a few ideas on how communities can prepare and what types of things they might be thinking about. And I think this is particularly important because when I ask communities what they're thinking about or if they're thinking about things, a lot of times they don't know what they should be thinking about. So it's, um, it's a good time to have conversations and get some ideas from them. 
So atmospheric CO2 over time is what this graph is. I actually, hmm, can you get this one? Because I do want to wonder. Possible. Okay, so um, on the left side, we're looking at 400,000 years ago, what the CO2 was, and we can see that it changes. Uh oh, we did something terrible here. Yes, I'll hold this, and now we'll get back on here. It's always fun to use other people's materials. Sorry about that. Okay, so over here we can see that um, the Atmospheric CO2 ebbs and flows over time, but we notice when we come to more current times that it just cruises straight up, basically. And this is what is referred to as climate change. So we've gone from, you know, on average, somewhere below 300 uh, parts per million in the atmosphere. We're well above 400 now. So therein lies our problem. Okay, so this is a, a graph of um, different options that we have, different computer models that have been made by scientists. Um, what we're looking at is CO2 emissions and the increase on this axis. Um, we're looking at 1980 here and 2100 here. So there are lots of models and they take into consideration different things, different changes that can be made. There's what's called feedback loops, which are natural occurrences. So for instance, as um, the glaciers melt and permafrost up north, up in the Arctic, begins to um, melt also, there's a tremendous amount of methane in the ground there. And so as that gets exposed to the atmosphere, it gets released into the atmosphere, the methane does, and that's an extremely strong um, greenhouse gas. And so that would be a feedback loop that some of these models account for and some don't a natural occurrence that results as the climate warms. So, there's basic trajectories that these models consider. So you can see a lot of noise in the models in these light colors, but what we want to focus on are, there are different options. There's um, staying, well, if we reduce where we're at, so actually stabilize our emissions and then begin to decrease them. Then we can stay below that two degrees centigrade target area. This is our current trajectory and if we stay on that trajectory we will continue to increase. Okay and we're looking at five degrees C change if we continue increasing CO2 at the same rate that we're increasing right now. We have another option which would be increase it even more at a greater rate and then we're looking at at least six degrees C. So we have choices to make here and some folks say well climate change is happening already so why do anything? <clears throat> and the point is it can get even worse. So, if, again, if we stay where we're at, we're on this trajectory right now. If we level off where we're at, we can actually begin to decrease over time, and by 2100, only have a temperature increase of three, on average, three degrees C, or we can really get aggressive and drop it down so that we kind of stay where we're at with uh, temperature increases. Okay, um, so now we're going to switch over. That's the big picture, the big happy picture on the, the, the entire, taking into consideration the entire planet. Now we're switching to upper Midwest and Wisconsin here. 
So um, these are observed temperature changes over time, and that's this brown line going up and down, and we can see that it's slowly on the increase. Um, and then what this is showing, the green color is lower emissions. So there was that decreasing emissions that we saw on the previous screen. We see that we're still, even if we lower the em emissions, there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere that's going to hang out there for a long time. So we would still see increasing temperatures here in the upper Midwest. If we go on the higher emissions scenario, you're looking at extremely warm temperatures compared to our average upwards in teens of um, degrees higher on average than where we're at now. And so that sounds nice sometimes of year, <laughs> um, but it has its challenges and especially to our natural systems. So some folks ask about well, why is it colder in the wintertime then? We have these crazy polar vortexes that we've been experiencing. And basically what happens is, back in the day, um, when the ice caps up in the Arctic remained stable, and the, the whiteness of the snow is very important, right? So you have stable, kind of consistent temperatures, that air mass stayed as one above, one unit above that um, cold Arctic space. But now we have um, some melting, and when we have melting, we have sea ice breaking apart and darker colors, and that darkness uh, kind of creates a cycle where it warms, so sunlight hits it, and instead of bouncing back into the atmosphere like it would when it's all white, it soaks into the sea ice and um, more ice melts, right? And so those differing temperatures kind of destabilize the air mass above the Arctic, and pieces of it break off and and kind of drip, drip down south and come over Wisconsin and other areas in the upper Midwest. So that's part of what we're experiencing. And even though we think warming when we think climate change and global warming, it can result in us being much cooler here periodically. Okay, so temperature gets affected in Wisconsin and then so does precipitation. And there's different ways. We're pretty aware, I think, currently, that um, it rains a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> um, so the, the long and short of it is warm air holds more moisture. So even as we uh, warm the air a little bit, we retain more moisture. So we don't necessarily have more frequent storms, although that's possible but we see more extreme storms because there's more uh, moisture in that atmosphere. <clears throat> so in the upper Midwest, heavy downpours um, have been increasing between 1958 and 2012 um, at a rate of about 37% more. So we need to think about what does that mean to our landscape, plants, animals, um, and how should we be adapting as communities to these kind of changes? Um, the other changes that we're experiencing are changes in snow cover, um, the duration that the snow is on the ground. Um, that can be beneficial to some animals and it can be very challenging to others. We have intermittent melting. I think last year was really a classic example of all of this. Um, sometimes we have rain in the middle of winter, and then that resulted in ice. And I know both my spouse and my elderly dog really had challenges with the ice on the driveway, and they were falling all the time. 
So we need to think about how do we adapt to that? What do we do differently that can make that a little bit better for us, for animals, whatever? Okay, we have many impacts on people beyond that. Um, and this example here is um, something that was put together by the Center for Disease Control, and I'll step through that a little bit. Um, we have rising temperatures. And the health people look at that and they say that, can, that provides more heat. So they're looking at heat stress and cardiovascular issues. We have more severe weather, um, it, which can lead to injuries and fatalities. Um, air pollution, asthma, and again, cardiovascular disease. This is just cherry, isn't it? Vector-borne diseases. So. That means more mosquitoes, more ticks, and the diseases they carry, um, allergies. And that's because um, a lot of that has to do with um, more pollen occurring at the same time. So we're getting blasted with pollen compared to what we used to have. Um, Waterborne diseases, blue-green algae blooms, um, cholera and that sort of thing, not necessarily in the upper Midwest at this point. Um, and then some other things that are related to sea level rise. So not all people are affected equally. So there's a, a social justice component to climate change too. Some of our most vulnerable and underserved populations are situated in a location in locations where their communities are more vulnerable. They're in areas <laughs> that tend to flood more. They're near brown fields. Um, industry may be located nearby, and so on. So we need to think about, as a community, what do we need to think about to address this to make sure that we're minimizing impacts on people, right? And that's. This is a lot to digest, so we're just going to pick things apart a little bit more. So for us, what we're looking at, we can get increased growth from longer growing seasons and more CO2 in the air. So they're gaining some of the carbon that they need to grow from atmospheric CO2, right? So when we think about something like that, we might think about, well, maybe we need to plant some more trees to get more of that CO2 out of the atmosphere. That'd be one option. Um, we're having extreme weather events, and I needn't talk too much about that because we just all experienced the big winds of the summer, and we know what that, um, what that effect was on the trees. And, Wisconsin Rapids and other parts of the state. Um, because of the warmer temperatures, some pests and diseases that couldn't sustain our weather conditions can. And as the temperatures warm, more can come, right? You go to the tropics and it's very hot and humid and there's a lot more fungus and bacteria and varieties of insects and that sort of thing. So they can populate up this way too. We have a barrier that we don't even think about that's preventing that right now. Um, and then the ranges that species can um, thrive are changing. And over time, in the past, that um, temperatures have changed over millennia, right? But a lot of the time in the past, it changed at a slow enough rate that species were able to adapt and kind of move. And we're exceeding their ability to do that at this point. Um, so some of the human Forest type impacts that have been occurring are if the ground doesn't remain frozen, there have been years where trees can't be harvested up north because they're depending on frozen ground to get their vehicles on kind of the wetter soils and that sort of thing. And then it also, um, altering tree species alters habitat for wildlife and fish and whatnot. 
So water itself is affected um, with warmer weather and longer growing seasons. Not only do we grow more trees and other plants, but we grow the plants in the water. So um, aquatic plants and algae become more abundant, and then you can have effects on temperature and oxygen. And it, from a community or a planning standpoint, where is it okay when you're thinking about shoreland management and where, um, where it's okay for houses to be in close proximity to a waterway? Um, what is that distance when we had extremely low water levels not so long ago in about 2012? We were all talking about low water levels. Now we're talking extremely high and the Great Lakes are actually breaking records with height. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage for that as communities? That fluctuation would be fine if we weren't part of this picture, but we're part of this picture. So how do we make sure our communities are safe is the question. So climate change, there's multiple ways of thinking about it. There's mitigation, which just means re either reducing emissions, so producing less um, carbon and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, or mitigation can also be planting trees and extracting that CO2 from the atmosphere. Or if we can come up with a technological way of extracting CO2, that's an option. But right now we don't know how to do that. Um, adaptation is just kind of changing our responses to change, right, is the technical um, definition of that. So adapting. So, okay, we get bigger storms. How do we adapt to that so that it has less impact on us? And then resilience is making things sturdier so that when these changes occur, um, we can bounce back. It has less of an effect and we can bounce back. And I only have five minutes here, so I have to whip through this. Um, so pretty much everybody should be involved in mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Everyone from individuals, businesses, it's at a local scale, regional scale, and um, all the way across the earth. So I'm going to skip that one and get into some examples. So here's some ideas for you for when you break into your small groups, although there are many, many more. How are we managing rain and snow melt? is a big question. Almost all of these examples have what are called co-benefits, so there's other benefits of doing different practices or doing things differently. So I'm not going to read them off, but they're listed at the top of the um, slide if you're interested in them. So wherever possible, one of the key things is to retain the water on the landscape. And that means protecting and restoring wetlands. Recently, our wetland laws have changed in Wisconsin. And we said, we really want to protect the rural ones because they provide habitat for ducks, but not so much in the urban area. And in the urban area, you really need to retain water. They're sponges. They soak up water. They hold on to it. They release it slowly. Um, we can put different forms of retention basins in place from everything from home size, which are rain gardens, rain barrels to collect that water and not deliver it to our waterways as quickly as possible. Pavement that can soak water in instead of just run it off. Um, and then using trees and green rooftops and stuff in landscapes. So that would be an example up here. Imagine what this would look like if all this green wasn't here. Um, this is an example of a um, rain garden. So the water runs into here. This, this storm sewer is actually elevated so that it'll pond the water and the plants will soak it in. And when it gets too high, then it would use the storm sewer. Um, and go off to a river or lake. So this is an example of what they call gray green infrastructure, and that's also found to be more resilient to big rain events than if you just have concrete. All right, so I have three minutes, is that right? Yeah. Okay, so flooding, we've talked about some of that. 
Um, you want to think about near the floodplains, what are you situating there? So are the cities allowing people to build right near them and then we're going to have to lots of cost and repairs and that sort of thing? Or do you want to put parks and public spaces and open spaces so if a river floods, that's what it affects. Um, and then sizing and placement of culverts and bridges is a biggie. This is from Bayfield or Ashland County up there. These are all Wisconsin pictures. They're becoming awfully familiar, aren't they? Heat, cooling shelters need to be thought about. Trees are real easy. One of my friends that's from uh, Bangladesh, she's like, we don't have cooling shelters. The older folks that have a problem with heat, they go out and they, midday, they sit under a tree and they, you know, read a book or something. So, we need to think about things like that and making sure people have access to cooling from our beautiful waterways that we have in the area. Um, and then there are structural changes we can make to, um, to make them more energy efficient and <laughs> not heat up <coughs> as much. So shading them with trees, shrubs, perennials helps a lot too because then you're not spending money cooling them. So you can reduce and make your um, properties or your cities or whatnot more efficient by changing your lighting, um, by changing the types of vehicles that you utilize, such as electric, hybrid, no idle type vehicles, um, adding renewable energy into the mix that the communities are using, um, and then again, other processes that help make buildings more energy efficient, and some waste management strategies that I think the mayor will probably touch on. <coughs> okay. Um, and then there's purchasing policies, there's food, there's choosing the appropriate price types of city street trees, right? You want some that will be resilient in 50 years. You don't want to plant, and we need a lot of replanting going on in this area after we lost all these trees. So we want to think about what are species that look like they'll be resilient to the changes that we're going to see into the future. We may also think about what if we get strong winds again? Maybe we don't want gigantic trees, maybe we want smaller fruit trees or something. And then emergency management, that covers a whole <coughs> plethora of communication and response. And do you have a secondary place that you can um, be operating out of and that sort of thing? And I'm not get, going to talk about that at all because that's a big world and I think they do a good job with that. Anyway, all right. So I'm cutting myself off. I don't even know how to turn. I'll take that. I'll take that. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to take the mic. <laughs> <laughs> so then, um, policies can occur at the local, state, national, and international level that help to guide us. That um, they're not the be all and end all, right? We're still the ones making the decisions as individuals, but they give us incentives um, and goals to achieve and shift the way, you know, the gas miles per ga gallon the cars are expected to get and that sort of thing. So there's a whole variety of things there, too. And that's my. <coughs> oh, that we're not doing yet. Okay, thank you. I think you did a phenomenal job of setting the stage. I probably could add a response slide to every one of your slides. Like, what is a consideration that the city might be thinking about uh, as it plans? And I think back to um, when I was uh, probably in elementary school and you know, the Teen Newsweek that was published when we published news magazines and they went into the classroom and like you know the polar bear on the piece of ice that was you know floating from the Arctic and why 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 we should care you know and as a young person. You know, I, while I, I was concerned about that, that seemed very abstract to me. It seemed like something so far away that what could I do here in my city in Wisconsin Rapids as a youth uh, to make a difference? And then I think, okay, 20 years later, 
what have we done or what haven't we done, right? And I think it's a little um, overwhelming sometimes to think about that or to, to really get caught in um, exactly what the trajectory looks like as it relates to a warming planet. And I think, um, you know, we all have to kind of remind ourselves we, you know, uh, we got to, uh, you know, think globally and act locally in a lot of ways as it relates to um, efforts within uh, sustainability or in the climate impact area. And you know, this year was an abnormal year uh, for all of us, right? In every w way possible, from uh, some extreme cold temperatures and, and uh, extreme uh, snow mount events, and then the freeze thaw events throughout the year. Obviously, the flooding event that happened in the, in the late spring in the city, and then the macroverse uh, wind events where we had not tornadoes but 91 mile an hour winds in the city. You know, those types of things, as you can imagine, for a person in my shoes really, really keep me up at night because one, we don't budget for those types of anomalies. And I'm really, really nervous and concerned about the extent that those things become a bit of the norm. And uh, you know, we have a whole plan, we budget every year, what we're gonna do for the year. But then you add in a couple of these events over the course of one calendar year, it really upsets the apple cart. So um, here I wanna talk a little bit about um, more sustainable city. I think back to, uh, I think on Monday, I was listening to WPR and um, there was a, somebody on there talking about the impacts to Wisconsin and what, what you know, a lot of, it was a call-in show. Um, and one of the things that stuck with me was, um, I think by 2050, uh, the projection around what, what kind of, what can Wisconsinites expect to feel, either in Madison or Wisconsin Rapids or whatever, um, in terms of like, from a temperature standpoint. And, and the, the person on the show talked about Missouri. And if there's one reason why I think we all live in Wisconsin is we don't want to live in a place like Missouri necessarily, or we would have moved there uh, to experience their climate. And so uh, it motivates me, and I think it motivates, it should motivate all of us um, to think about uh, ways that we're considering um, uh, efforts to, to mitigate uh, impact in our communities. So uh, my agenda here is uh, pretty straightforward. I want to talk a little bit about the wastewater treatment facility, um, uh, refuse and recycling, what's going on in that area for the city. Uh, riverfront improvements and what, what's the uh, connection or intersection between the topic you're talking about here tonight. Um, bikeability and walkability uh, being uh, also another intersection or a, a priority that uh, has some similarities and parallels with this topic. And the next steps, and I think it, it should parlay after uh, the county board chair speaks um, to hear from you, but also I want to share a little bit about what kind of I see on the radar for the city as far as next steps. So our wastewater treatment facility, here's a beautiful, beautiful aerial of the facility. Some might not consider our wastewater treatment facility beautiful, but I will because you know I like, I love government and I love local government, um, but obviously it's a, it's a major impact. I always talk to students, uh, youth in particular, and I say, what do you think about when you think about the city? What do you think about police and fire? What do you think about that? So what about when you flushed that toilet this morning? What, what about when you took that bath and brushed your teeth? And, and they're like, oh yeah, now I kind of you know, have a better idea what the city's about. So um, I'll start with the end of our uh, process, uh, biological process maybe, and that's wastewater. Um, so the city, uh, through the upgrade at the wastewater treatment facility a number of years ago, um, had uh, a couple of sustainability efforts or climate, I won't say climate objectives, but environmental objectives, and one of which, um, when you talk about the regulatory environment, the wastewater treatment facility is incredibly regulated, right? There's a lot of regulations, but one area that it is not uh, is around energy consumption. It's really left up to the local municipalities to decide how they wish to um, uh, power or operate those facilities um, to meet DNR standards or, or EPA standards. So the, the Genbacher, or Yenbacher, I guess as some people call it, um, is, a, is a generator that was in, uh, installed in the facility and basically, it takes uh, methane, which is a byproduct of the treatment process, um, as a biogas or as a fuel source uh, in, in the generator. And it offsets basically our natural gas consumption at the facility. And I think an interesting statistic is that uh, in 2018 alone, uh, that uh, Genbacher produced enough kilowatt hours to offset 192 residential homes for an entire year. Uh, so talk about a, a small facility, something we don't always think about, um, but uh, how much of an impact that type of operation can have uh, when it comes to uh, energy consumption. Uh, and for us at the city, um, it led to almost $150,000 in direct savings. So all of us as ratepayers or taxpayers, uh, there's also the triple bottom line as sometimes it's referred. There's the environmental impact, the societal impact, and here the economic impact um, to, uh, to the uh, facility and to the project. 
so also talking about the wastewater treatment facility, the Gembacher, um, there's also a, a heat uh, component to it. So the heat that a generator gives off, as you can imagine, produces heat, uh, will, is then uh, recovered and then repurposed to heat our uh, buildings within the facility. Um, something I won't get into a lot, but um, the facility uh, in 2018, after probably seven years, eight, eight years of trying to, to get this designation from the DNR, was designated Class A. And what that means is, uh, and maybe you've heard of uh, down in Milwaukee, um, the Milorganite product. Uh, because we were designated Class A, we now have a more valuable substance at the waste product stream, um, essentially the solids that are left over as a result of the wastewater process, um, that we can now convert into commercial grade fertilizer. Um, it's something that, uh, because of time and other constraints, we still land spread, we still land spread the, the fertilizer uh, to a, a local farm field. But in the future, the idea is, and we're going to be doing a, um, uh, an exploration on this process. We've had a couple of um, scientists take a look at it, and we're going to be working um, possibly with some uh, university resources uh, within the state to, to determine what is the true economic value of this waste stream uh, before, uh, instead of just sending it to local farmers, which is great, but if we can perhaps monetize on it, or there might be more of a product that can be created as a result of maybe mixing it with our compost facilities, Again, a major cost, a major investment that the city um, makes as it relates to kind of environmental measures as our compost sites. So we're trying to connect a few dots, if you will, um, in the wastewater treatment facility. So uh, at the end of the day, the facility sends back clean water into the river uh, from what it takes in. It produces green power um, and also produces a premium fertilizer um, to use uh, in our community. Uh, in the area of refuse, refuse and recycling, um, for those of you that are city residents, hopefully are pleased with the launch of both single automated uh, recycling as well as uh, automated garbage collection, uh, both in 2017 and 2019 respectively. Um, we were able to reallocate our labor resources uh, into other streets, maintenance, priorities, and activities, and ultimately resulting in a cleaner and safer operation, uh, not only for staff, but ultimately benefits for the community. Um, let's do a slide in here so we get out of place. Um, uh, statistically speaking, what does this what does this change meant to us? You know, we didn't just do this for the sake of switching to automated collection. We believe that there were going to be benefits as a result of this. And um, the, the slide behind me talks about 2016 to 2019 and the span of time, uh, the amount of tons collected into the, the makeup of that. Um, so before the launch of uh, automated curbside recycling collection. Um, uh, under just over 12% was of the total collected materials at the curb was recycled um, or recyclable materials, uh, whereas 87 the balance 87% was garbage. Fast forward to when we launched automated garbage or automated recycling and collection, excuse me, uh, and single stream collection, that number jumped 5%. Uh, so 5% of 6,000 tons is, is a lot. Uh, of, it's not an insignificant amount on a, five, on a percentage basis. It sounds like a little. Uh, but I think when you factor the numbers, then fast forward to most recently 2019 when we launched the automated garbage collection, which um, maybe to some people's disappointment limited how much people could throw and leave at the curb and send to the landfill, um, that uh, recycling percentage is almost up to 18%. Um, I believe it's still uh, fairly below the national average, but one thing that's not factored in here is the fact that um, we offer uh, community drop sites paper and cardboard and if you're like me you take your stuff directly there instead of commingling it so it, you're not wasting it effectively because a lot of that paper um, gets it's wasted if it gets commingled so one of the downsides certainly of, of the automated but by and large that program has been a success you know and being the host site for a landfill we care about prolonging the life of that landfill right uh, the less we throw in that landfill the longer that life of the landfill um, will be in our community uh, we don't necessarily want to promote landfill growth for, for various reasons, um, certainly from a emissions and a CO2 standpoint from uh, the methane emissions or landfill gas that emits from, from the facility. Um, I can mention, I don't have a slide about it, but um, ocean spray uh, contracts with the landfill for 100% of the landfill gas that's produced off the landfill. Uh, and I believe right now, or, or they've been in the process of negotiating, renegotiating with the landfill on a longer term agreement as that expired. Um, and so they have the exclusive rights to it. They use a good portion of it in their um, process, uh, processing at the, at the ocean spray facility. But there's, there's opportunity there for more use, more utilization of that landfill gas. Um, 
at the site. Uh, we've often believed that um, it's an economic benefit or an opportunity for a, another industrial facility to capitalize on that energy source. One, to meet their climate objectives, perhaps, from an energy consumption, but two, uh, the fact that it's not being emitted and wasted uh, into the atmosphere, that it's actually being burned and put to an economic um, uh, po positive use. Uh, move back to riverfront renewal. Uh, you probably have observed a number of riverfront projects both last year and now this year. Um, aside from all the nice park improvements that all result of that project, a core portion, in fact, a very, very significant amount of uh, portion of the cost has been around adaptation. That the riverbank uh, 100 years ago was, was renovated and they put in the river wall and all that great stuff, uh, but it hasn't really been touched in 100 years. So we've done some maintenance over the years, but um, this was really an adaptation. Uh, we didn't call it climate adaptation because it's a little bit polarizing maybe in some circles, uh, but really riverbank stabilization to preserve the riverbanks that during major flooding events and the reoccurring um, nature of them, uh, they were, those riverbanks were threatened. And uh, there's a good possibility that we could have experienced um, uh, continued erosion and lost those beautiful spaces. So when the um, Veterans Park uh, portion opens, uh, probably at the end, very end of our fall, um, is what, the way it's looking. You can see the storm um, water um, uh, treatment uh, measures there, where we're taking the water from running into the river and then actually being collected on the back side of the wall. Um, one, for integrity of the river wall, but two, preventing that runoff from just running right into the, into the uh, stream. Uh, so that's a, a, a core po uh, portion of that project. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I'm forgetting on adaptation, but really the riverfront project that in this, in this context was around adaptation and, and preserving those spaces for the, for the long haul. Um, urban forestry, uh, Nancy talked a lot about trees and the benefits of trees. Uh, I'll, I'll toot the city's horn a bit that um, when, when I first entered office, our urban forestry program was very dismal uh, at best. Um, so in recent years, uh, we've done a number of, made a number of steps to, to take on a more aggressive approach with our urban forestry program. Uh, we created two arborist positions, so we've got two certified arborists on staff at the city uh, today. Um, uh, before, we didn't have any, um, and at least in the most recent times. Um, we've invested in and completed a tree inventory and assessment, so the DNR assisted us uh, when we uh, co-invested in a complete tree inventory uh, assessment. So we had somebody literally inventory every single public tree in the city, which if you can imagine, it was about a six month process or longer. Um, and uh, we've got a great report now that talks about the health of our trees, classifications from fair, from poor to great. Um, and it helps us manage it and prepare for future investments in our urban forestry uh, uh, initiatives. Urban forestry has a lot of the benefits that Nancy talked about from a city perspective. One, keeps our streets cooler, and if our streets are cooler, they last longer. And if our streets last longer, we have happier residents, right? Because our streets are, are failing at a, a, a lesser rate or a, long, a, a longer term rate. Um, we've also hosted uh, five community tree sales uh, in a row uh, in the last number of years, and we've planted over 300 trees, uh, public trees, uh, in, our, in our parks and, and in our other places. And as you can imagine, with Emerald Ash Borer, um, we have a lot of work to do, and we have to be planting literally hundreds of trees every year just to replace what's being lost, not to mention what we lost in this last year's storm event, in the summer storm event. Um, and then we also go into the elementary schools. We recognize that, you know, I think back to my youth and, and what, you know, somebody came to talk to us or that Newsweek article or something else, but the Arbor Day um, is, a, is something we take very seriously in the elementary schools. In fact, the teachers have invited us in. It wasn't even us saying, hey, we want to come and talk to classrooms. Teachers wanted us to come in and talk about Arbor Day. And so we continued to go into the elementary schools to talk about, and for a whole hour, to talk about the benefits of northern urban forests um, and how our community can be healthier um, in a lot of ways because of urban forestry. Um, Monarch, uh, some of you are actually involved with these efforts, but we, we have a, a strong Monarch Habitat um, initiative that's happening in the city. Uh, so there's pledge for, for Monarch. Uh, butterfly uh, habitat promotion and creation um, back in 2017, and then we uh, dedicated um, June 4th and earlier this year as Monarch Awareness Day. So now we've got a, seven Monarch way stations in our community, thanks to some efforts of again people in this room, um, some on city property, and then uh, some on uh, not city property. And so there's also a look for a map or brochure out there which, which highlights 
the butterfly habitat walking tool, which is kind of a little hidden gem in our community, I think. Uh, going, going solar, Nancy talked a, a bit about what uh, the benefits of going solar and how this sort of affects um, uh, the topics we were talking about. Wisconsin Rapids, I'm pleased to announce, is one of four cities in Wisconsin to be designated gold status in uh, the Soul Smart, which is a federal Department of Energy program. Uh, the county, and, and I know we'll talk about that in some other jurisdictions around us, but we're among Eau Claire, uh, Madison, Milwaukee, and ourselves. Uh, there aren't any other cities in Wisconsin. And basically, what that means is uh, we've, we've gone through and reviewed all of our permitting and regulations as it relates to solar, solar installations in the city uh, to make sure that they're not onerous, uh, that we actually facilitate and make sure if somebody wants to go solar, they do so without a lot of extra effort. Um, again, further enabling individuals to be able to, to add that um, technology or, or that um, <coughs> production of energy on their own property. Um, so since then, we've got, we had three commercial installations and there's 12 residential solar projects that have happened in the city uh, since uh, 2018. I think your county board chair could be considered one of those. Uh, in the number of 12, uh, within the number of 12. Um, but other commercial uh, ones worth noting, um, the Spiros Doctors Clinic has got a large array on the roof, uh, 54 there. Um, we'll move into the next slide, which is the building we're in, which many, many of you are probably familiar with that project. Um, the 470 panel uh, system that's on the roof of the library here, uh, which uh, I guess is enough to power 25 average homes, which is pretty, pretty incredible. Um, Andy, I don't know, are we still one of the only libraries in Wisconsin to have a solar array of this, this nature? We're the, we have the largest solar array of any libraries. A uh, few of them have small kind of demonstration size ones, but uh, I think we're the only one who has really covered their roof with solar panels like this. Yeah, so it was a great partnership. I think, you know, as a city building, we're really proud to have this from obviously the, the environmental and, and um, societal, some of the economic benefits, but really from a demonstration standpoint that folks can come and see and interact with uh, something on a, on a building that the community owns um, and has been such a great um, uh, resource for our community all the way around. Another area of, of mention uh, for the city is uh, a topic called complete streets. So when, you, when I work with my city engineers and we're designing things, um, something we've, we've instituted a number of years ago, uh, that's complete streets. And that recognizes that Cars are not the only users of our streets, right? Pedestrians on our sidewalks, bicyclists on our streets, um, that we need to prioritize uh, investments that promote multiple uh, modes of transportation, no matter how our residents choose to interact and, and to get around uh, for recreational or for, for professional purposes. So uh, not only in our street reconstruction will you see that we've got bike lanes from our first bike lane that I painted in the city was on Baker, Baker Drive, you've probably uh, seen that. Uh, but like things like Chestnut Street, we painted Sheros. So any new uh, construction project in the city, we either include bike lanes, uh, painted bike lanes, or we paint the Sheros and sign them uh, that it's a shared road uh, with, for bicyclists and for um, cars. Um, and then additional recreational miles of recreational trails. Uh, so the East River Bank project incorporated recreational trails within it uh, downtown and then up into Buren, uh, so connecting into their network. So in total, the community and the city have 25 miles of paved recreational trails. Very uncommon, right, for a lot of cities, something that we're trying to tell more and more, not only for uh, visitors' benefit, but also the economic benefits and, and uh, potential residents. Um, we've also launched a bicycle benefits program, so if you're a bicyclist, look out for this program. Uh, I think we've got almost half a dozen businesses that have signed on, so basically, Think about the discounts you get with a Raider or a Royal card. If you've got a Bicycle Benefits sticker on your helmet, you get a, a discount at, at various businesses. So I know Taco John's is on board, and Cravings is coming on board. Um, Motivate on 8th Street, uh, near Little Caesars, all these businesses are recognizing that um, by offering benefits and incentivizing people to bike to their businesses can pay dividends. Um, but one of the pain points as we discovered is bike parking. That our zoning code historically has not required bike parking new construction and something that our new zoning code now requires. Um, but that was one thing that our uh, Mayor's Youth Council program did an assessment around equity, right, and, and uh, access for, for bikeability in that. And so that was very interesting. And so uh, important uh, for the topic that we're talking about here today, uh, that bike share has saved over 240 pounds of CO2 in 2018. Um, so we launched, 
another thing worth support, mentioning is the support of the River Riders Bike Share Program, uh, which launched in 2018. Uh, and then 2019 to date, 257 riders have taken almost 500 rides on our bikes, uh, up from 159 riders and 239, 230 rides um, in all of 2018. Uh, final couple slides here on citizen engagement. Um, uh, I signed on to the Global Covenant of Mayors, which used to be kind of a, a national organization and they recognized as the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord that probably as mayors should come together globally uh, because political boundaries aren't really uh, anything to anybody other than to our own jurisdictions that we all have a planet here uh, to, to take care of, uh, which is basically a pledge to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, track our progress, uh, and prepare for the impacts of climate change. Um, and then there's a national reporting consortium that we report information and measure um, to. Uh, and then the Mayor's Council on Sustainability, while it hasn't been active in, in most recent uh, year or two, um, they were successful in passing a resolution with unanimous city uh, council support. Uh, person Rayon is here tonight. Um, he supported it. Um, and it really assists in efforts to promote sustainability in, in the city with a broad focus on environmental, societal, and as well as economic benefits of sustainability. Um, and it's bringing new residents into the process. I think that your presence here tonight shows your interest, but I think we need to continue to bring more and more folks um, into the fold to become aware about the impacts and the concerns um, of climate change or a warming, warming climate. And I'll, uh, I'll just put a plug in there for folks that are in this room, certainly, but to support and promote uh, clean green action. You know, a very action-oriented group in this community, I think not every city has something like this, so I want to make sure we, we highlight all of your efforts for that. Um, in the area of partnerships, uh, the city is uh, was uh, selected and, and applied and was selected into the Green Tier Legacy Communities Program, uh, which is a consortium of partners. Uh, but basically, the aim is to achieve environmental stewardship uh, in various areas, such as water resources, and water management, and other sustainability practices. So on a, I don't know, Joe, I look to you on a quarterly basis, on a monthly basis, all the municipalities that participate, from Bayfield uh, to the north to some of the southernmost municipalities, uh, rapids and point in the middle here uh, all belong and we basically share best practices or better practices uh, and talk about efforts that are happening in our municipalities and learn from each other another two quick mentions uh, health and all policies uh, which is a it's a trendy kind of a buzz thing right now but it's something that the city partnered with the health department on um, to bring some technical assistance through uw madison population school of population health uh, so we've trained a bunch of city staff on thinking about a health lens. And the health lens certainly touches on all the things that Nancy included in her slide about, that as the climate, uh, as our planet warms and all these other impacts happen, health gets impacted in great ways, and in ways that we, we certainly aren't always, aren't always in the best way. So we're thinking about how, does, how do we apply a health lens to new projects? Uh, so for example, the senior housing and veterans housing that's happening in, in the Centralia Center parking lot, uh, that project, we use this help in all policies to explore areas of sustainability, areas of um, pedestrian and other accommodations from a health standpoint. And then the last thing we're going to be announcing very soon is we were selected uh, by UW-Madison's University Year program. Basically, UW um, has a program where they work with units of local government, so cities, villages, and counties, and we're one of the only municipalities they selected this year. Uh, they're currently working with Pepin County on the western side of Wisconsin, but we get to work with um, uh, doctoral and master's level students uh, for the next three years on various challenges that, that we described uh, to them where their resources are basically going to come in at no cost. We have to support, to offset some of the in-kind or the travel expenses and that, um, but we're going to be able to pitch a, a, a topic on sustainability uh, to have some, some experts from UW Madison and those that are going to going to school uh, in these areas of focus to assist the city. And then lastly, next steps. Um, uh, some of the things that are happening, there's been some press about some other projects, but one thing in the city that our, our utility and the city are working together on is exploring large-scale solar operations, uh, solar opportunities, both rooftop as well as ground uh, installations. Um, we're gonna continue to look at refuse and recycling rate improvements. We've got more work to do there. Uh, the national average, as I mentioned, is a bit above what we're at, and I think we can do more. Um, we have not set targets for CO2 level um, uh, emissions or energy consumption. Uh, we did, we've done some baseline analysis and, and that, but uh, have kind of shied away from doing anything too 
uh, buzzworthy and, and pressworthy because it sometimes can detract from the real efforts that happen within our city. Uh, climate adaptation planning, something we haven't again proceeded with any, in an informal sense. Uh, we've just explored ways that our infrastructure, you know, between extreme cold weather events, right, our water infrastructure is not holding up in those, those types of uh, events. The flooding, uh, windstorms, you know, uh, emergency management you talked about kind of all falls into that adaption uh, planning that we need to be uh, considering. Um, I'd ask all of you to support climate-friendly local ordinances. I think there's a lot of policy things we can be doing at the city level that we haven't really engaged in just because we've been busy in other areas. Um, and another piece is around food systems and food policy. And, and Nancy didn't talk uh, too much about that, but I think um, that's a concern that I have is, you know, the, the effect that a warming planet has on our ability and our food security issues. And there's a lot of work being done right now locally um, with uh, between neighborhood table and some of the other the food pantry, to try to think about how our food systems and kind of more localize uh, those things. So I, it's something that's just on the horizon, but something worth mentioning uh, here today. So that concludes because I think my timer is a few minutes over. So thank you. <laughs> conversation on several topics and uh, two of those topics that were very near and dear to me were renewables and sustainables and economic development and so as we worked through the first year and we worked on those two topics I began to realize that there was they were incredibly attached in many ways that people don't normally think about and, and the synergies and it was almost was a symbiotic relationship to me Many of the things that we talked about as solutions to the problems that we're here tonight to discuss have to do and relate to economic development. So when I was asked to speak, I thought, I want to do something different. I don't want to do the same thing. I don't want to talk about tons of coal burn. I don't want to talk about raising uh, ambient temperatures. I don't want to talk about this stuff. I want to give people something that, that, to think about that's a little different that maybe might resonate with you. So I thought, I'm going to talk about placemaking and how it relates, relates to renewable and sustainable. And so, if I can figure out how it works, is it the middle, is it the middle button? Yeah, the right one. The right one? Uh-oh. Well, I'm talking about the laser. I, I shouldn't I should fit. I'll go backwards here. Laser in the middle? Laser's on the trigger. Okay. Okay. we got to figure it out. This is my second PowerPoint presentation, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> doing great. Uh, so, this is what we came up with, the power of sustainable placemaking. Just a little side note, my first presentation was completely different. I was going to talk about economic development and placemaking and philosophy and theory and my ideas. And Nancy came up and looked at it in my office and goes, nope, not going to fly, hit the trash can. So that day was ruined. I went home very depressed. My wife will attest to that. But the fact is I started over the next day and I think I put something together. So what I'd like to do, she said, and she said, you've got to tell them what the county's doing. Okay, we can do that. So I put together in the format of placemaking some of the things that climate change has forced us to do as a county. And then beyond that, I want to go into what I've broken out as my ideas on placemaking and how they relate. So we will begin. Traditional placemaking. This is the stuff that normally we talk about when we talk about placemaking. We've done it for years, and the mayor will attest to this as well. Parks, riverfronts, water, trees, bike paths, got to have them. Got to have them. If you don't have them, the millennials aren't going to come. They don't, want, they don't want anything to do with them. Got to have those things. So those are traditional things that we talk about for placemaking. 
So I'm going to go there first. Parks, water venues, riverfronts, etc. What, how, did, how has climate change affected our traditional placemaking from the county's perspective? Well, we have, we've had to redesign an, exhaust, an auxiliary park entrance at Northwood County Park. Why? Because we have perennial flooding every year. We know it. We plan for it now. We were shutting down the park because our normal access was unusable. So we had to resign or redesign a rear entrance on higher ground to accommodate campers. Just one of the things we had to do. Bike has ATV trails. Well, everybody that's in Wood County knows that we just expanded our ATV trails, added mileage, opened county roads. Uh, we're very excited about that from an economic development standpoint. What happened? Our, our intensive ATV trail, trail use area, is in lowlands. It's flooding constantly. We have to shut it down. So look for us to be doing some redesign there, finding ways that we can keep that place open because of perennial flooding. Untimely perennial flooding, I might add. Housing. Some of the things we do in housing, we have PACE, which is, in, which is a long-term financing for energy efficiencies. Um, it gives low-cost, long-term loans to people to improve efficiencies in their house. Some of it can be used towards solar options, uh, insulation, things like that that save, save energy costs. Same thing for dining and entertainment. Those PACE loans are available for them, too, on commercial scale. Rural broadband. Another traditional place-making thing. What are we doing? Well, we still haven't really done much there. We're figuring that out. We're going to be looking at that more, but we're going to be taking advantage of things that we know we have the ability to take advantage of. The Ready Grant, which we just received from the USDA, which is a grant from the federal government that is going to help us with a technical plan for economic development in the county. Uh, very exciting stuff. Uh, North Central Regional Planning Commission, which is an organization that we decided to join uh, which is going to do work hand-in-hand -hand along those same things as far as the tactical approach to economic development uh, and any options we have with the state. We know we have a problem with rural broadband in the county. How we're going to solve it, we don't know yet. So those are our traditional pieces for placemaking mode. I would consider traditional. Now, what I would consider non-traditional placemaking, things that people normally don't consider or think about when they talk about making your community a place that people want to live in. Public health. This may be kind of on the fringe, but from a public health perspective, when it comes to climate change, many more blue-green algae alerts that we issue from our health departments. We're closing down beaches. This is a serious problem. We've had to, <laughs> we've had to deal with it. Brace. This was a, a Building Resiliency Against Climate Extremes grant that was given to Wood and Portage County to collaborate on things like uh, and it was a pilot project, by the way. Uh, farming sustainability as it concerns climate change. We know all about that. Long, uh, longer growing seasons, shorter growing seasons, more rain. We know that the latitude belt for growing corn is shrinking and it, it's, it, the projections are it will shrink more, those types of things. Mental health stress from excessive heat and rain. And someone talked about social justice. Was that, was that you, Nancy? And that's really where that one pertains. Mental health stress from excessive heat and rain. A lot of that has to do with people that have substandard living conditions that are more acutely affected by those two things or are homeless. Those are people we have to think about as well. Increase in tick and mosquito borne diseases. I think every year I hear of another disease that mosquitoes are carrying. Yeah. It used to be malaria. I thought we had that done with, but now it's everything I can't count the number of diseases that are borne by mosquitoes. Serious stuff. So we have, to, we have to deal with that as well. Sustainable groundwater quality and awareness. So those are all the things that they talk about under the what I consider non-traditional placemaking, public health through the BRACE grant. Things that people don't normally associate with placemaking. Emergency government, uh, the mayor talked about it. And the mayor and I have had an experience with that storm in July because we Worked out of an EOC for five days. And uh, so some interesting things came out of that, some interesting ideas. Uh, we found out things that we were prepared well for and things that we need to work on. Some of those things that we're doing differently now in Wood County. We now pre-fill and stage sandbags near the Yellow River because we're, we know it's going to flood. I remember growing up, maybe once in a while, maybe once every five years, you had a big flood in the Yellow River. Now it's every year. And guess what? It's not in April anymore. Sometimes it's in February. Who ever heard of flooding in February? We plan for it now. Product of climate change. 
community safe room with solar and backup generators. This was a really good idea, I think, that came out of uh, the storm in July as we sat around the table. It, it struck me uh, as we walked through the daily process, the first, the very first thing we, we had to consider was getting power to the hospital. Number one priority was how we were going to get power to the hospital. Once power to the hospital was established, long-term nursing nursing facilities, long-term care facilities, we had to get power to those, we had to get power to those. Did that pumping stations for the city so everyone at least had running water, established that. Guess what came up? Pretty soon we realized we needed to have respite centers for people that needed to refrigerate drugs, people that uh, needed to recharge CPAPs. People don't have landlines anymore. People are tied to their devices, and if you, don't, if you can't communicate, you're trouble. You're trouble. So they needed to charge phones, something you wouldn't think about. So it became critical that we opened up stations. And I, I can remember thinking, wouldn't it be neat if we had a venue that had solar power to it, that five minutes after a storm went through, if the sun came out like it does a lot of times, we're generating power, and we can open it up instantly for that, rather than having to fire up gas burning generators, diesel burning generators, or maybe not have the possibility of having power for a week, 10 days, but we, but we have the ability to do a thing. So that kind of idea came out of that situation, so sometimes good things or bad things lead to bad <coughs> ideas, but uh, that remains to be seen. But the emergency governor is actually thinking about that now. Solar at Napco Lake, we use this charging station for power outage is another thing. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we just uh, uh, appropriated the money to put solar panels at the shelter house at Nepal Way. We're going to use that as a test for the county to see how much money we can save or offset in power costs by using solar panels at, at Nepal Way. Uh, and along with that, we'll be looking at other options. That may be a, that may become a laboratory for renewables and state sustainables for the county. We may be testing little pilot projects out there that we may be looking at for the county. Very, very critical from an emergency government point of view. So another thing from emergency government. Another thing they're doing in emergency government is they're reaching out to other communities. A lot of smaller communities don't have emergency management plans for the types of things that the climatic chaos that we're, we're experiencing annually. They're not, they're not planning for it. And, and I think the mayor would, would attest as well that we saw that through that process in, in July, that uh, there were communities that were very well prepared, there were others that were not. And so those plans are now being given serious credence by those villages and communities. Yes, we need to have that. Everywhere we need to have that. Financial stability, something we don't talk about in placemaking very often, but from a community standpoint, it's important. Uh, we, had, we have the opportunity for Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation disaster related funding. So we look into those things so that we can get businesses back up and running as quickly as possible through those types of programs from the state. Uh, in fact, I think in town here we had some businesses that were very negatively affected. I think my wife and I can attest to how it rippled through the community when we tried to find a place to eat on Saturday night of the storm because we obviously weren't going to cook. We traveled to Plain, was it Plainfield. I think we went to Plainfield first. The places where there were packed, we couldn't find any place to eat. Ended up eating in Nakusa, and the place was packed. The McDonald's in Nakusa had shut down because they had run out of food. They had run out of food. I mean, imagine that. You, don't, you can't even fathom that if you, if you think about how the effects are, what you don't think about, and then it happens to you. The next night, okay, power's on some places. Let's go. Go up to Point. It was quarter to seven on a Sunday night. We couldn't find a restaurant that didn't have less than an hour away. Uh, it's amazing. It really made you think about the impact of things that we every day take for granted because of power. Moody's 427. I want to talk about this one because this is so... I don't know if I can think of telling is not the word, but it is so poignant. Uh, anybody know what Moody's is? Does everybody know what Moody's is? Moody's is a bond rating company. They rate bonding that you're going to do. The mayor, me and the, the mayor and I know about borrowing money <laughs> because that's what you have to do nowadays to make a county or a city run. You're forced to, especially with, with uh, levy limits. Moody's rates your bonds. So you want to be as high in the, on the bond rating scale as you can possibly be because that way you pay the lowest interest rate 
to the people that buy your, buy your bonding insurance. So it's important to stay high. I was reading through a magazine in early August or late July, I can't remember, and I came across an article, oh, I take that back. Nancy, I believe you sent me a piece that I read on. Moody's bought a company, and the company's name was 427. What the heck is 427? I read the article. 427 is a climate analytical firm. They do climate analysis and analytics, and they tie it. Why? I, my first question was, why, why in the heck would Moody's buy a climate analysis company? And then it started to strike, started, after a day, about a day and a half of thinking about it, started to roll around. Oh, wait a minute. They want communities that are prepared for this kind of stuff that have the plans for this kind of stuff and that are trying to make change for the better on this kind of stuff. And those guys are going to get higher bond ratings. And so when we did our, our, our call with Moody's this year, our bond call from the county's perspective on our bond issue, I asked them about it. And we talked about what we were doing in the county, what we, what we had planned as far as emergency government and solar arrays and things like that. And guess what? They were in New York. I was in my office with two other people making the call. And you could hear them jump out of their chairs at the other end. They were that impressed by that. Oh, that is really exciting to hear a county talking about that kind of stuff. So when we did our final call with our final nine financial advisor, I asked him, I said, how much of an impact did that have with Moody's? And he said, this year it didn't have a lot of impact. They were impressed that you were progressive on it and proactive, but next year is when it's going to start. So that tells us it has a financial impact and it has a piece of financial stability, something you would never talk, think about with placement, traditional placement. So now we go to the big, the big picture, the really big one, which is comparing, but this is before the really big one, I'll say, but this, I just wanted to show this, comparing traditional and non-traditional placemaking. And what you can see here is that this side is getting bigger than what we normally used to consider. So that tells, that tells me something. As a community leader, it tells me that I need to be, paid, I need to be pay, paying attention to these things because they make a difference. And if I want our county, and if I want my county board to think seriously about economic development, I better be starting to spend some time in this area because these things are starting to get outnumbered by these other things that we don't normally talk about. But we're doing a lot of stuff here. Why? Because we have to. So they must mean, that must mean something. So then I started expanding, thinking about it a little bit further down the road. And I went to, wow, very non-traditional place. If the, if the non-traditional things are starting to have an impact on how we do business in the county, how we think about how we do things in the county, what's out there that we haven't thought about yet? That's really non-traditional. What's really going to make the next big impact? Here's what I came up with. Philosophy. Hmm. Not talking about Plato, Aristotle, any of that, but philosophy, philosophy about climate change. What do we think? As a community, what do we think? Is it real? I don't know. I, I know this. We're experiencing some, some kind of climate change. I'm not going to argue with anybody about what's causing it, but I know we're having it. If we're having it and it affects us, we need to find a way to deal with it. Either deal with it, or stop it, or mitigate it. One of those three things. So that becomes how you approach it philosophically. <coughs> energy efficiencies. Pretty easy. We can do that. We can have philosophies on energy efficiency. It's better to save money, isn't it? Yep. I'm there. I'm there. Solar. The mayor mentioned SoulSmart. Great program. We're one step away from being certified gold as a county. I think we will be the second or third county in the state across the nation. We're probably in the first dozen. They were very excited when we first applied that the county was going to do it. Very excited. Uh, and so we, we charge hard. We're one step away from that. We're in the process, in fact, I think on the 15th, correct me, Bill, or Bill, uh, our two county board supervisors, are, we vote, I, I think we vote on the 15th on a county energy policy from our Renewables and Sustainables Committee, which we established last year. We established a Renewables and Sustainables Committee. Uh, they were charged with doing the uh, grunt work for the Soul Smart designation. The last part of the plan is to pass a county energy plan, uh, and that will be done in committee and then hopefully that night at county board. 
that's the last step, step for our soul smart, then we would also be designated, uh, Mr. Mayor, gold. Na -na -na, na -na -na. <laughs> <laughs> Resiliency. Here's the big one. Here's the big one. Resiliency. How well are you prepared? This is what Moody is concerned about. How fast do you get back on your feet? How fast can you get back on your feet? These things are common, we know it. How fast do you get back on your feet? It makes a big difference. So those are the things that you, you talk about philosophically. And what do you do next? Oh, um, uh oh. Now I did it. Okay. There we go. Then comes policy. Another very big non-traditional placemaking idea. Policy. So what do you do with policy? You, you develop policy. Meaningful policy from the philosophies that you have adopted and believe in. Create policy from accepted philosophies. We've done it. When we talk about solar, and I'm going to go really quickly, how much time do I have? I got another 10 minutes, right, man? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, we'll, we'll still yeah. make it before 8. If okay. You, if you only take 5. Okay. Create policy from accepted philosophies. Energy policy, so smart. That's one thing that we've done that's probably going to be a policy, an initial policy. But there's other policies that we probably will, will, will create as we go down the road philosophically. So what, and what I want to do is to demonstrate the entire solar, or not solar, but renewables and sustainables and those things as they regard economic development. And I think this next slide really shows what, oh, no, that's not the right one. No. Uh oh, I'm missing the slide here. Here it is. I'm going to go to this one and maybe I'll go back to that. Take the one piece. The one piece that we know we can, we can fiscally adopt. Solar. Easy sell. It saves you tons of money. It can save us in the county. If, if, if we get the projected savings that we hope to demonstrate at Nepco Lake and projected across the county on our energy buildings, on the energy that we spend on buildings, we're talking tens of thousands of dollars in savings an expense reduction. That's a no-brainer. I'm, I'm sorry, that's just a no-brainer. Take that piece, though, and as it relates to economic development, because we need economic development. We don't only need to save on our expenses in the county, but we want to grow our economic base so that we make this a better place to live, so we can draw people here that want to live, work, and play here, because it's a great place and we're smart people and we get it. Take solar, one little piece, right? And you add the fiscal impact of solar. Good piece, or maybe lower the taxes a little bit, uh, maybe create some money that you can do other things with that are good for your economic base, good for your citizens. And you add workforce development, because solar is a technology that's growing so fast it's unbelievable. There's a workforce development piece there. This is all just about solar, that's where we started. Public environmental health, no brainer. Solar, we're not burning coal, that's, I think that alone would be enough. We're not going to poison our air, but the fact is, there is a public and environmental piece when you're creating clean energy with solar. Finally, emergency government, resiliency. We just talked about Moody's, the bond rating, more fiscal stuff, uh, more benefits for your citizens after a climatic chaos event. So this is what we can do with solar. Solar moves very fast. The technology is blazing. Why we, why we sit here, it's, it's, it's developing quickly. quickly. Uh, electric cars, those things are a thing that are going to happen sooner than you think. So solar, I always say, we can get on the train right now from a county perspective, from a city perspective, from a state perspective, from any perspective you want to take. We can get on the train right now. It's moving fast. But we can get on. We can get, get a pretty good seat. Or we can wait. We can think about it. Ah, maybe, maybe you should think about this. And then we can get on later and we can get a crappy seat. But you know what I'd say? i say the hell with both of those ideas. I say let's hijack the train and drive it. Because we have that opportunity right now. We have that opportunity. And we can do it. Uh, that, and it's not taking a big risk. But we have that opportunity. We have a 150 megawatt utility scale solar array that's proposed in, in the town of Saratoga. The fiscal impact of that township and the county is phenomenal. That's just a start. That's just a start. Uh, paired with what we're doing in the county alone, uh, I, there's nothing but sunny days ahead. No pun intended. But the fact is, we have an opportunity that I hope we can all realize is the opportunity that it is, and we can take advantage of it. Because the window will close eventually, but right now it's wide open.
and we can drive through it. So the last thing I'm going to say is that we have a county energy policy that we're going to be voting on. If these things are important to you, which I believe they are, or you wouldn't be sitting in this room, you need to get in touch with the people that you elect. And you need to let them know what you think and how you want them to vote on these things. Because this is critical. Because if they don't hear from you, it's not going to happen. And it's going to be a fight for everyone else. And these two guys here, Bill and Bill, are both big solar advocates for the county. I'm glad to see they're both here. Uh, you probably don't have to talk too much to either one of these guys about this because they were on board a long time ago. But the fact is, this is an opportunity that we must take advantage of. Thank you. Well, that was all very timely. I appreciate it. Let me do that. We have plenty of time uh, left for our discussion. Before we do that, um, just a, a couple of announcements about like this one. Um, what we're going to do is, um, first off, I do want to thank uh, all of our sponsors uh, that we had up here. Um, they really put all this together. Um, also, there will be a drawing for door prizes. It's going to be at the end of the discussion. And I want to put in a plug uh, for the uh, climate change documentary in Paris to Pittsburgh, which is going to be shown at the library here 7 p.m. Thursday, October 10th. So a week from today, right now, we'll be, we will only be 25 minutes late. Um, so that'll be great. So uh, the way that this is gonna work um, is we've got some kind of community conversations um, and some kind of standard questions that what we'd like you to do is to break up into small groups, ideally not with the person that you're sitting next to, because uh, you can talk to them when you get home. Uh, talk to someone that maybe you didn't show up here with um, to kind of spitball some of these ideas so that we can leave with some action plans. Um, Nancy, do you want to hand those out? Sure. I'll hand them out. Here, you explain your questions. What should the city, the county, or just community in general be the types of things they should be working on? Or what did the mayor bring up that you think he should spend more time on or expand on and so on? So we have three different questions. Your small group doesn't have to talk about all three. Um, you can focus on one. You can focus on a handful. But what you really want to do is... Um, Come up with a solid plan, not just I think you should spend more time or money on installing solar panels, but where, how much, when. Try and dig into it as much as you can. Think about who should be taking the lead on the project or ideas that you're coming up with. And then we're also interested in, it doesn't always have to be the city taking the lead. So. Um, if you're with an organization, is that something that your organization would like to participate in or something you would like to participate in or spearhead individually? So we're not going to take names and that sort of thing, but we'll give you about 15, 20 minutes to work in your groups and come up with an idea or two and then do a kind of a report out at the end so that you can if you come up with five ideas, you're going to have to narrow it down to one or two to share with the group as a whole. But we would like um, you to write down those ideas so that even if you don't get to report them out to us, we have that information available to share with the mayor and, um, and 
Chair Mahan and others as they wish. So we'll, we'll type them in when we're done here into uh, a document and share that out. So, Joe, what are you thinking? Get into groups. Yeah, uh, break into After groups folks. of like about five people. And oh, don't forget, we do have some refreshments in the back. So, right. so start uh, forming your group and I'll just bring them uh, around your clipboards so you can write down your answers. We don't have any, and whether you know that could really offset um, carbon footprint. Um, how we have a lot of commuters in our area and how we don't really have a lot set up for them to ride share, we don't believe, um, and that that could be something, you know, we have no ride share lot down here in Southwood County and that where like Marshfield, if they were going back and forth, they, you know, they have a ride share lot up there. Um, this is a tricky issue because we like our you know, our development and we love our airport, but those jets are using a lot of carbon, a lot of fuel coming in to play golf. And I kind of go, how many people are on that plane? <laughs> um, and so the possibility of encouraging those um, participants to um, purchase carbon offsets. Um, and uh, so that's that's kind of our first number one kind of idea there, you know, just um, and developing, you know, kind of using um, solar on all new, you know, really encouraging anyone with a new project to just developers, builders, you know, just automatically, it should be economically, you know, feasible nowadays to just go, we're gonna put solar in, we're gonna make it energy efficient, and, you know, use, you know, low flush toilets, dual, I mean, just the whole, you know, works in that, you know, that's what we need to be moving towards. Um, and uh, I'll throw my little thing in there. I wondered why with all this flooding and all this, you know, increased um, water that we're having, maybe we could be using more hydro turbines um, that sort of thing on some of our, you know, waterways and stuff to, to utilize um, that electricity, but I don't know enough about it, so here we go. Thank you. Hi, Joe. Joe, Joe, could I, I just make a correction on that? It should be Nepco Lake. How? N-E-P-C-O? Yes. -E oh, like that? Yep. I fixed it, I saw it. Lake. <laughs> Okay. No, it's not Lake Nepco. It's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nepco, you said Lake Nepco. Okay, our group came up with a number of ideas, but we're only supposed to report back on one. We had... Uh, <laughs> your best one. Your best, best one. Yeah, we had a couple ideas on carbon footprint, but I'll give you our idea on resiliency because we think nobody else will come up with this one. And we think the county should have establish an organic seed bank for our area and possibly the Division of Emergency Government with help from Master Gardeners, the Decor Iowa Seed Savers, and um, the Native Americans. And I guess the group that would probably be most willing to help on this would be the Family Farm Defenders. Thank you. Summarize that, right? Very good. Okay, that's it. Thanks, Joe. <laughs> Just an idea on that, I go to almost every event that Hitler's has, yeah. And they have a lot of them on like seed saving and different things like that. Okay. They could they could direct you so much in that direction. Not just because he's sitting here. <laughs> I, mean, I go to almost every. He'll tell you. I've been at almost every event that he's had. Okay. They just and they have a huge customer appreciation tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> um, but they, I mean, you need anything. They, they they can help you with all the seeds, how to plant, where to plant. Okay. Um, phenomenal. Everything. Okay, I guess you just volunteered. You ever did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll do more about gardening and healthy living. That's in All right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Hi, my name is Jerry. Um, where our group kind of talked about exi using uh, existing uh, resources or things we have about the re reduce, reuse, recycle ideas, and, and we, we kind of dwelled on that. Uh, 
rather than like creating new things, I mean, choose to reuse, I think is a fairly, becoming a fairly popular program. We talked about things, programs like that, drop off, uh, 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 hazardous waste drop off things, trying to make that more visible. Um, one of the things we talked about was, uh, I'm a newcomer to the area, I've been here a few months, and it was, it's difficult to find, to just guess what's out there. Uh, I come from an area that has a lot of that program in place, and and uh, it's not, it's kind of vague, and, you know, you find out with the the newspaper uh, kind of going away sort of on a local level and, and communication, it seems like it's harder and harder to get information, uh, and so I'm trying to figure that out, it's difficult. So awareness, I guess, is something that we talked about that probably could, could, could be improved uh, through communication and uh, education, too. Um, um, we talked about uh, oh things like you know uh, ideas about traveling pickups where you had a, 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 a just a trailer that showed up you know for one one day for four hours and and uh, in a popular populated area I guess where where they could pick up uh, waste or recyclables or whatever um, uh, business accountability um, there seemed to be some. <coughs> Uh, lack of awareness uh, on how much um, businesses might be accountable for their part in, in any issues <coughs> regarding climate change, uh, carbon footprints, recycling, whatever you're looking at. Um, and also uh, from a small and large business perspective, how much it, we as individuals, do we are we proactive of telling a small business or I'm just asking, not telling them, but asking them how, how uh, how they deal with their waste and things like that, and you know, if we have ideas to help share that and, um, and see if they'll you know, help educate them a little bit on how they uh, deal with their excess material, uh, whatever they happen to be doing, um, how they eat and build their buildings for that matter, whatever. Uh, just looking for opportunities for discussion, um, and also government on a larger scale for, for larger uh, corporations and whether it's local or state level, county level. And um, then there was a question that came up about uh, schools and, and also getting back to the recycling thing and how much uh, they can probably produce a lot of recyclable materials and paper products and things. And if there are, the question I guess was raised about if there, um, there are things in place uh, right now that uh, we don't know, um, you know, what goes on in our public schools and also private schools. What, uh, what, um, what can they do, I guess, for carbon footprint okay. issues? So, um, anybody else? Did I miss anything major? Okay. Just, just okay. to on the Choose to Reuse program after 12 years, this is uh, probably the most popular one we had this issue. Okay. We had 325 cars come through the line. Okay. We had, we had 9,200 pounds of it. Metals that we took in free for people, refrigerators and stuff like that. Okay. Are you talking Grand Rapids? No, we're Southwood County. Yeah. We're Southwood County. The people come from Madison to pick up stuff. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very popular. Hi, I'm Terry, and we kind of talked about a gamut of things. Um, we talked about the trees, and we kind of touched on that um, with the speakers that um, talked today. Um, eliminating some of the use of cement. Um, apparently, the production of cement is a very polluting process, so working to eliminate that. And we talked about solar panels on public buildings, but I think the aha that came about in, in toward the end of the discussion is where does climate, you know, impact our upcoming elections? And I think, you know, to support those candidates that support your ideas for climate, you know, sustainability, recycling, all the things that we talked about tonight with resilience and mitigation. So um, just basically, you know, helping to support those candidates in, and getting them elected for those that support your ideas. Did I miss anything? A little bit on hydroelectric power, but um, we're kind of 
uniquely situated where we can take advantage of that, but that doesn't really hold true for the, the remainder of the county. So. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just going to stand right here. <laughs> so, my, way my name is Jeannie Peterson. Um, we talked a lot about the rainwater gardens. We thought that was a cool idea. Um, helpful to hold the rainwater back, and we all know there's lots of puddles to get through. Um, one of the big ideas um, talked about right away was instead of dedicating benches that we see on our park um, bikeways, have dedications for rain gardens. Mm -hmm. And um, if we could look at our biggest employers for taking that rainwater off the roofs and the parking lot, that might be a good place to start. Have city and schools partner together to research and plan and build. Um, instead of mowing the culverts and the ditches, um, like we see that nice green grass at uh, Lincoln High School, to have students plant milkweed and cattails or a group of um, adults helping with that, um, going off of that philosophy idea instead of like green grass becoming, you know, the thing to look at or the way things should be to look at weeds differently um, so that it's not considered a weed. Um, have school boards change policies for the groundskeeping, um, educate our policy makers, not just our children. Um, revive prairie places near schools. That was a big thing for a while, and, and now it, schools have gotten away from that. And then looking at permeable surfaces, um, maybe in between some of the parking lots or at the edges of parking lots or um, in places that would help. And then that would be less concrete use. <laughs> Uh, so I think that that's all of our groups, um, and, and since we have the board of county chair and the mayor here, do you guys want to say anything uh, about some of these notes? You know, I hear a lot about transportation, and I think it's something that, um, to the point about elected officials, something in Wisconsin that we cannot do at the local level is create uh, regional transit authorities. It's prohibited at the state level by state law. So. A lot of us at the city level, uh, the champion is Mayor Hanna, a good friend of mine from Appleton. He is the stalwart when it comes to establishing uh, regional transportation uh, authorities. And I think Rapids is like right there with them, like we can benefit. Um, on the solar on the new projects, I forgot to mention the pool project. Gosh, how could I forget? Um, we're actually exploring uh, adding rooftop solar to the pool project, right? Sun, summertime, swimming, like it's the right thing to do, right? So um, we're looking at that, adding that into the project. It was not a part of the budget, but we're exploring ways that we can maybe make that financially feasible. So, um, but again, thank you for your engagement and your ideas, and I think those were just a couple things I wanted to mention. Funny on the groundskeeping, I know Tom Rayom and I, he's on the Public Works Committee, made eye contact. We talked about looking at prairies and grass differently. So the hill that's along the expressway, that's consciously not, well I shouldn't say consciously, because part of it was an equipment limitation. But there's a lot of debate going on at the Public Works Committee right now about mowing that again. No, and I think, no. um, so <laughs> show up to the City Council meeting in two weeks because it will be, it's been discussed quite a bit. I think that's going to be at the next Council meeting. Uh, so anyway, I just got to put a plug in for that in case you're passionate. Yeah, next Wednesday at noon is a dedication of the uh, Hillside Prairie on the Expressway. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah so people are welcome to the next Wednesday. Yeah. It's the, so two related projects to the hillside, right? I think. So thanks for coming. Yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I should like to close it. Rick Potter gave me this and said it was my trophy. So I would just like to thank all the little bulbs. <laughs> Actually, great ideas. Uh, um, I, I like the ride chair thing because that's one thing that my wife has mentioned for years is that we don't have a ride chair area for. We have a lot of people that commute to Plover and Stevens Point out of Wisconsin Rapids. I think that's a fantastic idea, very simple idea to uh, to establish. Uh, I I really identify with the shoreline at Temple Lake because I watched that lake be raped, uh, and I grew up on that lake basically. And it's it's criminal what's been done there. But the fact is that that's state statutes, and a lot of that we can't do much about. Uh, sadly, 
Uh, solar and on, on the projects, I mean, you're talking to the solar guy, that's a, that's a given as far as I'm concerned. The organic seed bank, all very good ideas, all, all great ideas. Um, the, the storm water retention targets, things like that, all great ideas. I loved it. It was great to be here. I, I love the ideas that it generated. Um, thank you very much. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and since I, I have the mic, I do want to just re related to transportation. Uh, in case you don't know, at Midstate in Wisconsin Rapids, last year we installed a solar-powered electric vehicle charging station that is free uh, and open to the public. There are uh, eight different spaces for you to charge. Yesterday, my students and I installed a smaller version of that on our Marshfield campus. Last week, we installed one on our Adams campus, and in a couple weeks, we'll be putting one on the Stevens Point campus. Um, there's, a, there's a chicken and egg sort of problem here, and we, we have to, to build it before people will buy and engage in electric vehicles. Um, and so we're trying to lead the charge right there. Also, uh, yeah, we had a door prize. Nancy, come here. <laughs> I'm going to hold this up so she doesn't cheat. Rick, how many door prizes do we have? One, two. We got two door prizes. I'm going to mix them up. Okay. Mainly to the people that came day. early. Uh -oh. Okay, not that one. You can't pick your own name. Okay, so is this for which door prize? Well, I think we're the same. Yeah. What's, what's first, your uh, okay. the first one then? Door prize number one. Doug. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That to Doug, and then he can find me, and then he'll get the door prize. For okay, the and Fred Clark. Okay, Fred, Fred, and, and people don't forget to turn in your sheets that you've filled out. And Rick, did you have anything more about the uh, LEDs? Those of you, uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, Doug. Uh, those of you that stuck it out to the very end, you also get a trophy when you leave. Uh, so look me up, I'll be giving you each a LED a light bulb. If you wonder what you can do right now, go home, uh, find an incandescent bulb and uh, change uh, that LED bulb into it. And you'll be taking uh, the first uh, step for uh, energy uh, efficiency uh, and uh, saving money. So as you go out, I'll give you a handout and an LED uh, light. And thanks for all of you that uh, stuck it out to the very end.